Cary Grant was the kind of man who could walk into a room and immediately command attention. The men admired him, while the women were drawn to his suave, debonair persona. He wasn't just good-looking, he was the epitome of cool, the definition of what every man of his era aspired to be. Cary Grant was, quite simply, everything. And it wasn't just his charisma that made him unforgettable. Grant's career was as glittering as his public image. He absolutely dominated Hollywood's golden age, earning a spot as the second greatest male star on the American Film Institute's list, right behind the legendary Humphrey Bogart. But here's the thing, behind all that glamour, the million dollar smile and the roles that made him a household name, Cary Grant's life was far from perfect. In fact, it was marked by a tragedy that started when he was just a child. Now, years after his death, his ex-wife has come forward, revealing the heartbreaking truth about the struggles he faced behind closed doors. And in this video, we're going to break it all down for you. Cary Grant's childhood was nothing like the polished, elegant image he later became famous for. To put it simply, it was a nightmare. Born Archibald Alexander Leach on January 18, 1904, in Bristol, England, Cary grew up in a tough, poor neighborhood where life was a daily struggle. His family barely had enough to get by, and the environment around him was rough, with many people turning to alcohol to escape their harsh realities. Unfortunately, the future star's father, Elias Leach, was no exception. Elias was a chronic alcoholic, his drinking habits eroding the already fragile foundation of the family. The young Grant was very aware of his father's addiction and the instability it brought into their home. Elias's drinking not only drained the family of their meager resources, but also made him emotionally and physically absent. When he was present, Elias was often unreliable and distant, a shadow of the father figure Carrie so desperately needed. If his father's absence wasn't hard enough, his mother, Elsie, was also struggling, but in a different way. Elsie suffered from severe depression after the death of her son and Carrie's brother, John, which was terrible during this time because it wasn't well understood or treated back then. She was often too overwhelmed by her own sadness to pay attention to her son's needs, leaving young Carrie craving the love and care that she couldn't give. He wanted so much for his mother to be there for him, to offer comfort and reassurance, but she was too lost in her own pain to provide the nurturing that he needed. To make things even worse, the most heartbreaking moment of Carrie's childhood came when he was just nine years old. One day, his mother simply disappeared from his life. His father told him she had gone on a long vacation, but that wasn't true. In reality, Elias had committed her to a mental institution without telling his son the truth. For years, Carrie lived with the belief that his mother had chosen to leave him, which deeply hurt him and made him feel even more abandoned. With both of his parents emotionally unavailable, Carrie had to fend for himself. He learned to hide his pain behind a charming and confident exterior, a mask that helped him cope with the loneliness and fear he felt inside, even at such a young age. This mask would later become the suave, debonair persona that made him a Hollywood legend. But what no one knew is that it was born out of a need to protect himself from the emotional scars of his childhood. When Grant's life seemed to be falling apart, he found a glimmer of hope in an unexpected place. That place was the theater. Growing up in a chaotic and emotionally barren home, the theater became a sanctuary for him, a place where he could escape the troubles of his daily life and discover something that brought him joy. As a child, one of his few pleasures was attending pantomimes at Christmas with his father. Despite their strained relationship, these outings sparked a fascination with the stage that would soon become a lifeline for young Carrie. It wasn't long before Carrie began to spend more and more time around the theater. He became friends with a group of acrobatic dancers known as the Penders, or the Bob Pender Stage Troupe, and quickly found a sense of belonging that he lacked at home. This group offered him a glimpse into a world of creativity and performance, and Carrie was eager to be part of it. He trained as a stilt walker and began touring with the troupe, finding in the theater not just an escape, but a purpose. Carrie's love for the theater grew stronger with each performance, not just because he loved being on stage, but because it made him part of a community that appreciated him. 
At 13, he began working backstage in Bristol theaters, learning the ropes and immersing himself in every aspect of the theater world. He even found himself responsible for the lighting during magician David Devant's shows at the Bristol Empire. The more time he spent backstage, the more he fell in love with the magic of theater, and he began to see it as a way out of the sadness that filled his home life. School, on the other hand, was another story. While Carey was capable academically, he wasn't particularly interested in his studies. He excelled in sports, particularly in the game of fives, and his good looks and acrobatic skills made him popular. But he was also mischievous, often choosing to entertain his classmates rather than focus on his homework. Carrie's heart simply wasn't in school, and eventually, it ended up with the youngster getting expelled. Some said he was caught in the girl's lavatory, while others claimed he was involved in theft with some classmates. But there was more to the story. Carrie had made up his mind that he wanted to leave school and pursue a career in entertainment. Just three days after his expulsion, he rejoined the Penders, fully committed to chasing his dreams. Around this time, Carrie's father began working in Southampton, and as a result, he co-signed a contract with the Penders, ensuring that Carrie would have a steady salary, room and board, and dance lessons until he turned 18. This was the beginning of his journey into the world of entertainment. After joining the Pender troupe, Carrie's life began to take on a new sense of purpose. Performing pantomimes across the country, the youngster developed a physicality that would become a hallmark of his acting style. Graceful, agile, and always in control. His experiences with the troupe broadened his abilities and opened his eyes to the possibilities of a career in entertainment. The big break came when the Pender troupe set sail for the United States on July 21, 1920, for the RMS Olympic. At the time, Carey was just 16 years old, and the trip across the Atlantic felt like a new beginning. On board, he had a chance encounter that would leave a lasting impression on him. Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford, two of Hollywood's biggest stars, were on the same ship, returning from their honeymoon. Carey, always eager to learn from those he admired, found himself playing shuffleboard with Fairbanks. The actor's charm, confidence, and physicality were qualities Carey would later incorporate into his own persona. Arriving in New York, Carey and the Pender Troupe performed at the New York Hippodrome, the largest theater in the world at the time, with a capacity of nearly 6,000 people. It was a big stage for a kid his age, but Carey rose to the challenge and performed in 12 shows a week for nine months. The grueling schedule was a testament to his dedication and love for the craft. The production of Good Times was a success, and it was during this time that Carey began to see the fruits of his hard work. His performances were gaining attention, and he started to believe that a future in entertainment wasn't just a dream, it was within reach. As the 1920s rolled into the 30s, Carey's career began to pick up steam. He appeared in numerous stage musicals and comedies across the country, slowly but surely building a reputation as a versatile performer. His big break in Hollywood came in 1932 when he signed a contract with Paramount Pictures. However, the studio executives felt that Archie Leach, his real name, didn't have the ring of a leading man. So they rechristened him Cary Grant, a name that would become synonymous with class, charm, and sophistication. Cary would later legally adopt the name in 1941, fully stepping into the persona that would make him a Hollywood icon. Carey's early years in Hollywood were spent in short films and low-budget features, but even in these small roles, he stood out big time. His performance as a wealthy playboy in Blonde Venus caught the eye of both audiences and critics, hinting at the star power that was beginning to emerge. But it was in 1933 that Carey's career truly took off, thanks to Mae West. She saw something special in him and chose him as her leading man in two of her most successful films, she done him wrong, and I'm no angel. These roles catapulted Carey into the spotlight and established him as a leading man in Hollywood. While Carey appeared a bit reserved in these early films, he was quietly crafting the screen persona that would define his career. Audiences couldn't get enough of his suave demeanor and effortless grace, and he quickly became a sex symbol, the kind who was approachable and non-threatening. 
His unique speaking voice also made him stand out. Carey's attempts to rid himself of his Cockney accent resulted in a clipped, distinctive speech pattern that only added to his charm and made him even more memorable. By the time his Paramount contract expired in 1935, Cary Grant was no longer just another actor. He was a star. But unlike many of his peers, Cary didn't want to be tied down. He chose to freelance his services, giving him control over his career and the freedom to choose scripts that interested him. This decision allowed Cary to craft a body of work that would include some of the greatest films in cinema history. By the late 1930s and early 1940s, he had become one of Hollywood's most beloved leading men, seamlessly moving between comedy and action roles. Grant's screwball comedies, especially with Katharine Hepburn, made him a household name. In movies like Holiday and Bringing Up Baby, their chemistry was electric, with Grant's humor and timing shining through. Grant also found a perfect match in Irene Dunn, with whom he starred in The Awful Truth and My Favorite Wife. Their playful banter and on-screen chemistry made these films classics. But Grant wasn't just about laughs. He showed his emotional depth in Penny Serenade, earning his first Oscar nomination. While Grant excelled in comedy, he was just as captivating in action roles. Films like Only Angels Have Wings and Gunga Din highlighted his ability to handle both danger and charm with ease. His collaborations with top directors like Howard Hawks and Frank Capra further solidified his star status. However, it was his work with Alfred Hitchcock that truly set him apart. Hitchcock saw a darker side to Grant that others hadn't tapped into. In films like Suspicion and Notorious, Grant played complex characters with moral ambiguity, adding a new layer to his on-screen persona. As his career progressed, Grant continued to take on roles that showcased his range. In To Catch a Thief, he starred alongside Grace Kelly in a glamorous caper full of clever banter. And in North by Northwest, he delivered a performance that perfectly blended suspense and humor, cementing his place as a Hollywood icon. Though Grant never won a competitive Oscar, his legacy in film is unmatched. His performances in movies like Mr. Lucky and An Affair to Remember remain timeless. Unfortunately, despite his iconic success and widespread fame in entertainment history, Carey's life behind the cameras was deeply scarred by the traumas of his childhood. These wounds were something he never fully shook off, and sadly, they continued to haunt him throughout his life. For much of his childhood and early adulthood, Grant believed his mother, Elsie Leach, had died after abandoning him. This was the story his father told him after committing Elsie to a mental institution when Grant was just nine years old. For nearly two decades, Elsie remained in Glenside Hospital in Bristol, suffering from what was then diagnosed as mania and depression. It wasn't until 1938, when Grant was already a Hollywood star, that he learned the truth. A relative informed him that his mother was still alive, and as expected, the shock was profound. Determined to reconnect, Grant traveled back to England to find her. Their reunion was deeply emotional, but also tinged with sadness. The years in the institution had taken a severe toll on Elsie, leaving her emotionally fragile and disconnected from the world. Though Grant did everything he could to support his mother after their reunion, moving her to a more comfortable living situation and visiting regularly, the damage had been done. Elsie never fully recovered from the trauma of her years in the institution and the prolonged separation from her son. For Grant, the absence of his parents during his formative years left a void that haunted him throughout his life, especially in his relationship. For one, he was terrified of getting abandoned by the people he loved, just like he thought his mom had abandoned him as a child. This fear stayed with him and affected how he approached love and marriage. Throughout his life, Grant tied the knot five times, but none of his marriages lasted. Each time, he hoped marriage would bring him the love and security he longed for but his fear of being left always got in the way. His first marriage to Virginia Cheryl in 1934 ended in divorce just over a year later, with Virginia citing allegations that Grant had hit her. She also demanded a substantial weekly payment from Grant, which added to the scandalous nature of their split. Next up, his marriage to Barbara Hutton, a wealthy heiress, was a high-profile affair that faced its own issues. 
Despite their initial affection, the marriage ended in 1945 after three years. They were nicknamed Cash and Carrie due to Hutton's immense fortune, though Grant refused a prenuptial agreement, aiming to prove his love was genuine. Their split was less acrimonious compared to others, but marked by public scrutiny and the complexities of Hutton's wealth. The actor's longest marriage was to Betsy Drake, but even this relationship faced significant strains. They married in 1949, and their marriage lasted until 1962. Despite a period of therapy that Drake introduced Grant to, their relationship deteriorated, culminating in a divorce. The breakup was noted for its emotional intensity, and it came after Grant's affair with Sophia Loren, which added to the turmoil. His marriage to Diane Cannon was also turbulent and ended abruptly. They married in 1965, had a daughter Jennifer, but divorced just three years later. Their separation was exacerbated by a car accident that Grant was involved in shortly before their divorce was finalized. This period was chaotic, marked by legal and personal troubles that reflected their strained relationship. Carey's final marriage to Barbara Harris in 1981 seemed more stable compared to his previous relationships. Harris was significantly younger and had a positive influence on Grant, who was in his later years. Despite the age difference and the various trials Grant faced earlier in life, this marriage surprisingly lasted until his death in 1986. However, it wasn't until decades later that the world truly realized the struggles that the Hollywood legend fisted in his lifetime. Years after Grant's death, his fourth wife, Diane Cannon, has shed light on some uncomfortable truths about their relationship. In a recent interview, Cannon, who was 28 when she married the 61-year-old Grant in 1965, reflected on the complexities of their brief but rocky marriage. Despite their public image, Cannon's memoir, Dear Carrie, My Life with Carrie Grant, reveals a much darker side to their life together. Cannon's book details how Grant's behavior often veered into controlling and unpredictable territory. She shared how he would criticize her for seemingly minor things, like not using a coaster or parking her car incorrectly. These moments of criticism were coupled with his intense, sometimes explosive outbursts, leaving Cannon feeling constantly on edge. She described a marriage where Grant's demands, including his insistence that she take LSD with him, added to the strain. Even though their marriage ended in divorce after just two years and was marked by scandalous headlines, Cannon's recent reflections show a shift in her perspective. She admitted to falling in love with Grant all over again after finding some old, heartfelt notes he had written. In the end, Cary Grant's life and behavior were undeniably shaped by his troubled childhood, which left deep emotional scars that influenced his actions and relationships. Despite his flaws and the turbulent aspects of his personal life, Grant remains etched in our memories as one of the most legendary actors to ever grace a television screen.